in the beehives, opening up the hives, robbing, it, robbing the bees of their honey, enduring many stings, weighing two to three hundred pounds to the extractor on a narrow tread wheelbarrow through loose ground trying to manipulate with sticky gloves, lifting then pushing your load of boxed unextracted honey up the chute into the extractor compartment was a real challenge and a mighty hard work. The days were long. We worked by the day, not by the hour. When so very tired as the sun was sinking in the west, and we knew we'd had enough work for the day, the boss would often say, hurry boys, let's get finished and so we can move to the next yard for an early start in the morning. You can well imagine how on a cloudy day with the field bees in their hive, how an extra liberal number of stings would add to the long day. It was just plain understood that a worker shouldn't complain with fewer than a hundred stings or so in a day. One time someone placed a bee or two in the veil of Floyd Barnett. He was stung on the end of his nose, the meanest place that a sting could come. Usually it would close both eyes. He would have given a day's pay, which was about three dollars then, to have known who did it. I can now say with others who knew all about it that Ellis Raid Wade, Red Wade, was the guilty one. At East Layton, we had to unlock a corral gate, drive in, then through the corral occupied by a furious bull, unlock another gate, drive out and lock the other gate without losing the bull or getting gored. This was a real trick, not so bad, with two or more to help. Leland Reese once was the gate tender and on purpose the driver left him to dash through on foot behind the truck. I think tempers uh, sort of arose over this. When I was trucking the honey and I was always alone, I had a real challenge in a situation like this. One time while in East Layton we finished the day of work and then made up our beds, which were on army camp cots. And as you well know, they, slope, they sloped to the center. All of us went into town to eat at Staley's lunch shop and play some pool. And while there, a torrential rain came down. And upon returning to the camp, we found our beds full of water. We squeezed out some of the water from the blankets. And then the salamanders began coming out of, up out of the ground and wiggling around. Wet bedding was spread out on the ground among the salamanders and the workers slept with their clothes on in the this wet, be wet bedding. Since I was the trucker, I slept in the driver's seat, and that was a long, cold, and uncomfortable night that I shall always remember. Transporting hives full of bees was a real undesirable job. Before dark, we would smoke the bees, then staple the hives, the tops and bottoms together. We would then let the bees settle down. And after dark, we would add tobacco to the smoke smoker, we'd plug the entrances, and load the hives on a truck or a wagon. Many bees would always get outside, regardless 
and crawl. The jarring ride aggravated the bees, as any jolt or jarring will do, and it was common to tip off the entire beehive while crossing a ditch. Sometimes, at least it did happen, where whole loads have been tipped over. Of all the messes you can imagine, this has to be, without question, the worst. You can't leave them. You can't just pick up and go. You just have to dive in and stay with what has to be done. When bees crawl at night, they find every hole in your veil or your pants. With thousands of bees crawling about, you just rub out the stings by the score at the time and mash the offenders as you can find them. And of course you just have the time of your life hoping that there will never be another like it. You soon lose the count of stings by tens and twenties. Crystal Springs, owned by R.T., was headquarters for the bee men while working in Box Elder County. After work and supper, we would surf on a surfboard board on the pond just below the resort. With our clothes on, we would leave the bank on the surfboard, and the driver would usually succeed in unloading uh, the rider who was fully dressed, and he'd usually land out in the pond uh, in the tall grass. Foolishly, while we were sometimes in swimming inside Crystal Springs' main pool, we would um, go to the outside uh, pond. We'd get go down underneath the water and then float with the cool water from the pond on the west side of the building, which is on the outside. We'd float through a 14-inch pipe underneath wa the water into the inside pool and then rise up out of the water. And this meant holding your breath about the limit. I've thought many times since that this prank could have had serious consequences. R.T. was the Utah's largest beekeeper. He learned his trade from E.I. Root, I think that's the initial, E.I. Root, who was the nation's beekeeping pioneer. He lived in the Midwest. Most Utah bee men owe directly or indirectly their knowledge of beekeeping to R.T. Successful beekeepers like William Ellis, Arthur Pledger, Horace Knight, Lawrence Budge, who a few years ago was the president of the American Beekeepers Association, they all worked, first worked for R.T. R.T. Reese had bees in Twin Falls, Idaho, where Horace Knight operated them. His Uinta Basin bees took him into the new, de new area where he purchased sections of land that contained shale, shale oil, which he foresaw would be valuable. When his estate was apportioned, this land was given to his daughters. We, therefore, own some of it. After a few years, we let it go for taxes. It is now covered with oil wells and is worth millions. In his feeble years, Reuben Thomas Reese would go outside of his home to the leaking water tap where the bees would be gather gathered gathering water. He would pick up a bee, put it on his arm, and force it to sting him. He would then look up with a smile and say, A bee sting will do some of us some real good.
good. In the early 1930s, I acquired two hives of bees from Arthur Pledger, and from these I increased to eventually 150 colonies. I packaged bottles and gallons of honey. Hundreds of gallons I sold, complete with the can and label, and delivered them for 50 cents a gallon. I sold, the checkerboard, sold to the checkerboard market, 28th Street Market, Brambles at Five Points, California Free Market, Reed's Market up on the east part of the city, City Market and others. These sales brought in handy winter time cash. I had tragic results in wintering the bees in the Pleasant View Meadows. Fog and dampness brought disaster. Wintering next to the mountain on Mac Wade's property was tragic in a different way. The deer from the mountains would come down in the wintertime and rub against and tip over the hives and eat the honey and wax, leaving the bees to die. Wintering midway up the hillside in Pleasant View was the best. Skunks, a real enemy, could be poisoned. Human vandalism varied from year to year. A common prank would be to take auto tires and roll them downhill into the beehives, trying to knock them over like ten pins. Janet was once assigned to weed around the hives on the good earth. <clears throat> she was instructed to use the smoker to quiet the bees. This she did. To pump the smoke with its spark into the dry June grass and set the whole hillside on fire. In fighting this fire and trying to put it out herself, instead of leaving it, it's a wonder she didn't catch herself on fire with serious results. In 1955, I had to undergo surgery on my spine for back problems. And because of this, I sold my bees to Bernard Cragen. And since that time, we have never had bees of our own. However, we have invited others especially Bishop Nielsen from Harrisville to bring his bees in near the orchard so that they could pollinate the blossoms of our cherries. One time in early summer, I was called to go into South Fork in Ogden Valley to the side of the stake camp. The spring waters had nearly washed the main bridge out, and we were hauling rock in and seeking to reinforce the bridge. At this time, I well remember an incident that was interesting. Kenny Humphreys, a neighbor, had a cut-down car that he called a hot rod, homemade. And he took this up to the camp and happened to appear on the job about the time that we were there repairing the bridge. He thought he could cross the river, ford the river with this machine, regardless of the big rocks that were in the stream bed. This he tried to do, and when he finally reached the center of the stream, that's as far as he could go. He tried every way to get out and made quite a stir and a show, but finally gave up, realizing that he was stuck. The girls received quite a charge out of this. We happened to have a large one-inch 
derrick rope. And we tossed it out to him and he hooked it onto his car. And 40 or 50 of these girls got onto the rope to pull him out. And before he was even ready, they pulled this car out, up over the bank, over small willows, and took it across par uh, part of the open land before we, hardly any of us, knew what was happening. This was an incident that reinforced something to me, and that was the strength or the power of many hands. When I was a young boy, my father allowed me to fulfill an arrangement that the church had made with him to transport the girls to the state camp in the summertime. I was younger than any of the girls were, but I was the driver, and on many different occasions for several years, I transported the girls to the girls' camp as a little boy driving the truck with a load of girls and their provisions and their chaperones. Also, I was given the responsibility by my father to transport boys and girls to the Logan Temple to do baptismal work. And in so doing, we traveled up Brigham Canyon through Mattaway and then up over the old trail that went in and out through the canyons and down into Wellsville. I've often thought about that since, that that was quite a responsibility for a mere lad to be driving under those conditions on dirt roads, a load of other boys and girls. And then the most important thing was that this was all done without any mishaps. When my sister Ruth was a small girl, she was riding on a little chair in front of the buggy seat, and my mother and father were driving. As they were going from the house down the hill, for some reason they made a sudden stop and Ruth fell out from her chair down underneath the horse's feet. And this was a frightening experience, especially at the time, because one of those horses was a newly broken colt and wasn't to be particularly trusted. And my folks always felt that they were really fortunate and lucky. And I'm sure that Ruth, in recent years, or certainly since that time, when she's thought about it, realized that she was lucky not to be trampled by those horses. I've always had a fear of being in tight places or enclosed in tight situations. I think this dates back to a time when, as a young boy, we crawled through the culverts underneath the roads and at one time when I was in a culvert and my clothes happened to be caught on a piece of the culvert iron that was protruding, and I was having a hard time to get out, the boys shouted, hurry, the water's coming. Well, I certainly got out of that culvert in post haste leaving part of my shirt behind with some scratches. And that was a frightful experience, one that I shall never, never forget.
One day in the summertime, I happened to be down to the home of Earl Reese's. And as we were visiting that day, Bill Bates, who is a relative of and a visitor with the Chamberlain people, the Burnett people and the Chamberlains, came dashing down through the yard, all pale and out of breath. And he said, there's a dead man. There's a dead man up there. And when we settled him down, he gave us the assurance in no uncertain terms that he had seen a dead man up near the mountain in what was called in the days where they mined in the, from the, when they had mines in the mountainside, Legginsville. And so we told Bill we'd go back with him. And he was so sure of what he had seen that he was willing to go and take us to the place. And when we got up near the mouth of Pine Canyon, he said, this is the area in which I saw him. And we looked around and scouted in every direction, but couldn't find what he said existed. Then Earl Reese said, I think I can smell him. And then he said, I know I can. And so through the scent that we followed, we were directed to the place where we saw this outstretched hand through the bushes in the oak brush. And surely there were the remains of a man that had been it looked like eaten by animals and his parts scattered around. We gathered up some of the parts of his bones and left them about where we saw them. And we didn't know what to do, but as boys, we thought of something and so we gathered up rocks made a big pile of rocks on top of him and covered him up. And then someone made a remark and Earl Reese said, I think we better say something. And so Earl, as he reports it, said a few words. I suppose that was his funeral service. When we returned home, the word was passed back to the box elder authorities of what we'd found. And they immediately sent the mortician and others up there, and they were directed to where this pile of rocks were. And they uncovered this man and took his bones and took them down and gave him burial down in Willard. And the word got back to us that we had not done the proper thing by this man. And then we learned later that he had been living with one of the farmers in winter at Willard, and he was afflicted with the problem of drinking. And I think it was thought and supposed that He'd gone on a walk and taken his bottle with him and become drunk and something happened to him and he died while I, he was up in the hills. One cool fall day when I was returning from school by the way of the streetcar at 7th Street, the car came to a sudden halt. And we all got off the car because we knew there was some problem. A woman had been run over by the streetcar. 
and she was totally torn to pieces. She had a heavy coat on. And I remember that the Johns people had a store right nearby. And there were some baskets there that they had had fruit in. And the shovel was obtained, a scoop shovel. And literally, when the authorities came, they took the scoop shovel and scooped the body of this woman. And I think, it, I'm sure it was the, at least it was the parts that they needed to gather up and scooped them into this basket and they were taken to the mortuary. That's been a hideous memory to me to see a human body scooped up into a basket. When my father's family was were young, we occasionally went to town in the Ludlow or the large buggy that had two seats in it and a canvas top. It would take a good part of the day to go into Ogden and sometimes we'd spend our time there visiting Grandmother Williams who lived on Kiesel Avenue and she was in her older, later years, I think she died at the age of nearly 100. At any rate, when we returned home, often it was in the dark. There were no lights. And in the fall of the year, as I remember on some occasions, it was rather cold. No heater in the buggy. And usually we weren't very well dressed for warmth. And we'd go to sleep, and some of us would get under the seats in the buggy and lie down. And then, to help pass the time away, we'd count the telephone poles as we passed them. It was a long, long way to get back home. And then when we get home, we had to unhook the horses and unharness them, put them into the stable, and then go into a cold house and start up the fires and crawl into cold beds. These were the days. I remember as a young boy traveling to Salt Lake with my parents and family to general conference. The tabernacle in those days wasn't particularly filled but we, in order to get a good seat, went early. We usually sat down on the main part of the assembly hall in the center. And we took our lunch with us so that we could eat lunch during between the sessions and still maintain our seats. And it seemed such a long time to sit through both sessions of conference. But nevertheless, that was really a great experience of seeing some of the early leaders of the church. President Joseph Fielding Smith, President, um, later President uh, Heber J. Grant, Counselor Anton R. Ivans, Anthony H. Lund, Melvin R. Ballard, George F. Richards, and many of the early authorities in the church. We had glorious times together on those occasions. And even though it was a long ways from home, we gained an early appreciation of the church and its importance in our lives. During our September 1973 vacation from the Ten Ogden Temple, Paul, Flora, 
Mildred and I drove to California. In Hayward, we visited Rodney, their son, and his family. Together, in his van, we toured San Francisco, seeing many interesting things. We also visited our sister, Edna Wheelwright, in Mel Milbray. I was stricken with a horrible pain in my neck and left shoulder. Even with the help of pain medications, our return trip home was a difficult and painful one. Knowing uh, <clears throat> I must find relief from this distressing and constant pain, I sought and found a neurosurgeon in Ogden who had